Robert is one of the great, courageous freedom fighters leading the way, and we all must follow him. Please give him a very warm Ottawa welcome. Thank you very much. Can you see me over this? <laughs> you know, I appreciate you coming out, uh, aside from all the stresses of the uh, registration process and the exercise of the freedom of speech in the contemporary West, it's also a time of personal stress for me, and so I beg your pardon about that. I was just uh, actually on the phone talking with my wife about my brother-in-law who is uh, ill. He, he thinks he's a chicken. And I was saying to her, you know, we're just going to have to get him committed. And she said, well, I would, but I need the eggs. And that about sums up the West's immigration policies. Uh, the West is committed to a firm policy of unreality and of fantasy about the nature of Islamic Jihad and the implications of the nature of Islamic Jihad for the massive migrant influx that is now inundating Europe and also coming to Canada and the United States. It is an unreality that is enforced at the highest levels. And that's what insanity is, is taking falsehood for truth, taking fantasy for reality. And what we have is an insane foreign and domestic policy, particularly in regard to immigration. I'm not here to campaign for Donald Trump. You're not going to vote for him no matter what I say. And I'm not even sure I'm going to vote for him myself. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I probably won't. But there is a very important aspect of the controversy regarding his proposal to ban temporarily immigration from Muslim countries until he said we can figure out what's going on, by which he appears to have meant until we have some idea of a way to distinguish jihadis from peaceful Muslims among the migrants. And the odd thing that I wanted to point out to you about that controversy is that in all the inundation of uh, vituperation toward Trump, after he made this proposal, the comparisons of him to Hitler and the attempts to ban him from Britain, indeed, and so on, nobody came up with a counterproposal. Nobody even bothered to offer one. Nobody said, well, you know, there, there is a problem here. There could be jihadis coming in among the migrants, so we have to do something about it. And as a matter of fact, I was kind of surprised. I saw two very respected writers, people that I respected, and who are reasonably uh, well known and, and, and established on the scene. I'm not going to call them out by name, but they said after Trump made this proposal, they both wrote columns saying, no, Mr. Trump, we don't need to ban Muslims from entering North America. We need to ban Islamists. Well, great. The problem is they don't carry membership cards in Al Qaeda or ISIS. They don't wear t-shirts that say, I am a member of the tiny minority of extremists. The, you can't tell who's who, and that's just the problem. As a matter of fact, ISIS last year, the group known as ISIS to most people and to ISIL to the president, as ISIL to the president of the United States, and as the Islamic State, as far as they call themselves, they said last year, they issued a manual to their own operatives in the West saying, don't carry a Quran, don't wear a beard, don't attract suspicion in any way. Blend in with the ordinary people in the population. Make them think that you're an assimilated moderate Muslim or even go to church. Now how are you going to screen out somebody who doesn't show the signs of a devout commitment to Islam that generally do accompany the people who are, that generally are manifested by the people who are jihad terrorists. How are you going to tell when they are deliberately concealing that? Another thing that is checked for in the vaunted vetting process 
that Barack Obama has said he's going to apply to the Syrian refugees admitted into the United States, and I believe that a similar vetting process is going on here, or will be going on here. The problem is, what exactly are you vetting for? You're vetting for a criminal record. You're vetting to see if there is some background of criminal activity. Well, that's another thing ISIS says. They're not going to recruit people with criminal backgrounds because precisely they know that that's what authorities in the West are looking for. So Tashfin Malik, if I stand away from this thing, will it not whistle? Can you still hear me? Yes. On the other hand, there is video and history here, and they have to check me for hate speech. And so, hello, Canadian authorities. Uh, anyway, I hope this will work. The uh, shooter in San Bernardino, Tashfin Malik, she had passed five separate, separate background checks from five different U.S. agencies. Five separate agencies let her go because she had no criminal record. She was exactly the kind of person that the authorities in Canada and the United States want to bring in to, these to our countries. People who appear to be assimilated, moderate, ready to accept the parameters of Western secular pluralism, ready to live as productive citizens in the West. She wasn't. There was no way to tell. There's more about this as well. The Islamic State in February 2015 threatened to flood Europe with 500,000 refugees. What they meant was they were going to put jihadis among the refugees, as well as overwhelm the welfare system apparatus in all the European countries and Canada and the United States simply by force of numbers. They said there would be 500,000 refugees coming. In the later on in the summer, in August and September then, in fall, they started to come. Did that have anything to do with the Islamic State's threat? Is there any reason to think that they might have known beforehand that this was going to happen since they warned us or threatened us that it was going to? Should that be dismissed out of hand? Not only that, in September, once they started coming, there were many, quite a few refugees in Lebanon they did not mean to stay in Lebanon. They didn't stay in Lebanon, but the point was they were crossing right from Syria into Lebanon on their way to Europe. And then, of course, to North America, some of them. And the Lebanese education minister was in London. He gave an interview and he said there were 20,000 active jihad terrorists among the refugees in his country waiting to get to Europe. 20,000. In October, the following month, two, two of these refugees landed in Greece and were admitted into Europe and via the Schengen Accords, of course, were able to travel all across Europe with no passport controls, no further checking. Once they got into Europe, they were in. In November, they joined up with six others and murdered 130 people in Paris. And that same cell, of course, was responsible for the Brussels attacks just a few weeks ago. All this illustrates that you cannot tell among the migrants who the jihadis are, and jihadis are coming. And so what exactly are we supposed to do about that? What the Western authorities would have us do, Justin Trudeau, Barack Obama, David Cameron, all the rest of them, certainly Angela Merkel in Germany, they would have us say it is worth the risk it is worth the risk of a few jihadis to be able to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in Syria and to be able to bring in these people who will be such an asset to our nations. In other words, it is preferable to have people being killed in jihad attacks in the West. That's preferable to stopping this refugee flow in view of the fact that there could be jihad terrorists and there will be jihad terrorists among the migrants. Now is that really a good trade-off? Saudi Arabia, how many refugees have they taken? 
Absolutely zero. Do you know why? Are they racist, bigoted Islamophobes? They didn't take any of the migrants because they said, you know, there are jihad terrorists among those people. And the world opinion makers said, oh, okay, well then, you're, all, you're excused, but not Europe, not Canada, not the U.S. If we say the same thing here, we are racist, bigoted Islamophobes. But the fact is, the Saudis actually share a linguistic, cultural, and religious bond with most of the refugees. It would be much more coherent for them to go there than to come here. They would be much more comfortable there than here. Not only that, do you know, you know about the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, right? You've got to make it once a year, if you're once, a, once in a lifetime if you're a Muslim. And you can only make it in 10 days every year. The first 10 days of the month Zulhijjah that's the only time you can make the, the pilgrimage to Mecca. That's why there's always a crowd control problem in Mecca every year. And sometimes we hear about people being trampled to death and so on because there's this massive influx of people into Mecca. And it's very hard to manage. And as the world population of Muslim grows, the crowd control problem in Mecca grows. But it's only 10 days a year. So 355 days a year, think about this. Where are those people staying while they're in Mecca? As a matter of fact, outside, inside Mecca, outside Mecca, right nearby Mecca, I'm not sure where exactly, but they have set up on a permanent basis tens of thousands of air-conditioned tents that are fully appointed, like hotel rooms, for the pilgrims to Mecca. 355 days a year, those things are absolutely empty. It's perfect. Send the migrants there. And they're Muslims. They can even go to Mecca. But there's a reason why this is not happening. And the reason why this is not happening is not even about the fact that there are jihad terrorists among the refugees, and the Saudis can say that, and the Canadians can't, and the Americans can't, and the Europeans can't. The reason is rooted in theological imperatives within Islam. So I happen to bring, of course, tonight my Quran. I don't leave home without it. If you can take out your Qurans, we'll turn to... So you didn't bring it? Chapter 21, verse 47. Chapter 21, verse 47 says, We shall set up just scales on the day of resurrection, so that none will be wronged in the least, even if it be the weight of a grain of mustard seed, we shall suffice as reckoners. Even if what be as a grain of mustard seed? Your good deeds. See, the idea is you're going to appear before Allah on the great day of judgment, and they'll, he'll have these big scales set up. And your good deeds will go on one scale, one side of the scale. Your bad deeds will go on the other. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you go to paradise. And if your bad deeds outweigh your good, you'll go to hell. So your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. Now think about how that would drive you crazy if you were a believing Muslim, or if you are. Because how many good deeds have you performed? How many bad deeds? How much does each weigh? And so you have no idea, on this, based on this system, whether you're going to sp spend eternity in paradise or in hell. You have no idea. And not only that, but the Quran is full of lavish illustrations of, I feel so short back here, I'm going to move out. Um, I feel so short everywhere, but <laughs> at least I don't have something up to my eyes, I can barely see you. It, the problem is that hell is so lavishly described in the Quran. Allah is going to pour molten lead down your throat for all eternity. And he's going to burn off your skin. And as soon as your skin is burnt off, he'll issue you a new one so he can burn it off again. And it just goes on and on and on in the Quran. It's very lingeringly and lavishly described. And so you're reading that as a believer, and you're thinking, if those good deeds don't outweigh those bad deeds, then that's what I'm in for. Now, there are several ways out. And this is where it becomes important for unbelievers in the Quran. One of the ways out 
is delineated in chapter 9, verse 111 of the Quran. Paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed for Allah. And that's the rationale behind the suicide bombers. You see, if you kill somebody, if you blow yourself up in a crowd of infidels, you're guaranteed paradise. You don't have to worry about the scales. Also, a hadith, a hadith is a report about, that's what the word means, hadith, report, about Muhammad's words and deeds. And Muhammad is the excellent example for Muslims. According to the Quran, chapter 33, verse 21, if Muhammad did it, it's right, it's good. If he said it, you should do it. If he did it, you should imitate it. And somebody came up to Muhammad <clears throat> in a hadith and said, can you tell me a deed that is greater than jihad? And Muhammad said, I can't think of such a deed. So there's nothing greater that you can do than jihad. So if you think about it, you don't even have to kill and be killed, although that's guaranteed. But if you wage jihad, it outweighs all your bad deeds. Suddenly your scale goes good deeds, very heavy, bad deeds, light. Now this is a point of analysis where Western understanding of the jihadi mindset is completely wrong because Western analysts refuse to look at Islam. For example, it just came out that Salah Abdeslam, the Brussels killer who was also involved in the Paris attacks, he was dancing with women and drinking alcohol a few months before he committed mass murder in the name of Islam. And so once again we saw what we saw after 9-11. Remember after 9-11 and footage came out of the 9-11 hijackers and they were in strip clubs and people were saying they're not really Muslims, you see. And Salah Abdeslam, same thing. He must not really be a Muslim. He's going drinking alcohol. But you see, if you understand what I just explained to you about paradise and hell and the weight of jihad versus anything else, then you see, he had it all covered. He knew he was going to kill and be killed. He knew he was going to do the greatest deed of all. So what's a couple of beers and a dance with a girl? You know, I'm going to paradise. Let's go have a beer. No problem. There's no way it's going to outweigh the good deeds that he's going to do. The jihad in the, for the sake of Allah. <clears throat> and there's another aspect, and this is what brings it all back around and deals and makes it relevant for our discussion about the immigration problem. Chapter 4, verse 100 of the Quran. You can turn there if you remember to bring it. He who emigrates, emigrates in the way of Allah. Emigrating in the way of Allah is not like emigrating to get a good job and be able to send a check to your relatives back home. Emigrating in the way of Allah is emigrating to bring Islam to the new land. It is a very hallowed concept in Islam. The first emigrant was Muhammad. The beginning of Islam, as a matter of fact, was the emigration or the hijra, the flight, the move from Mecca to Medina, when Muhammad and the Muslims moved from Mecca to Medina in order to bring Islam to Medina and to convert Medina to Islam. And that is considered to be the beginning of Islam at the emigration, not when Muhammad became a prophet. That's the year one of the Islamic calendar, the emigration. So the verse says, he who emigrates in the way of Allah will find in the earth enough room for refuge, maybe in Canada, and plentiful resources. And he who goes forth from his house as a migrant in the way of Allah and his messenger, and whom death overtakes, his reward becomes incumbent upon Allah. His reward becomes incumbent upon Allah. So you see, the Quran <clears throat> sets up a very frightening prospect of the scales of judgment, but then it gives you two ways to make sure your scales will work out well. Suicide bombing, essentially, being kill killing and being killed, and emigration in the way of Allah. So, <clears throat> a few years back, there was a controversy in Minnesota over a public school 
that was actually in a building that housed also a mosque. And every student at this public school was a Muslim. And they were having Quran study and prayer during school hours. Now you probably know that that's not legal. That in the United States, of course, it's the same thing as everywhere else in the West, essentially, that religions are not taught in the public schools, and if the schools are receiving taxpayer funding, then they shouldn't be teaching any particular religion. <clears throat> and so this school was investigated and ultimately closed. And it was uh, reopened later under another name, and I'm sure it's still doing the same things, but that's another story. The name that it had before it closed was the Tariq Ibn Zayed Academy. Now, in all the controversy over that school, I never saw anybody say who Tariq Ibn Zayed was or why they named the school after him. Was he a great Muslim educator? Was he the John Dewey of Islam? Was he the Buckminster Fuller of Islamic education? He was nothing of this kind. Tariq Ibn Zayed was one of the conquerors of Muslim Spain. And he was famous for landing his armies on the beach, securing the beachhead, and then ordering the boats burned. And people said, why are you burning the boats? And he said, because we are emigrating in the way of Allah. And if we die here, our reward will be incumbent upon Allah. So we are going to Islamize this land, or we're going to die, or we're going to die after having Islamized this land, but we're never going back. Now what do you think is the significance of naming a school in Minnesota after a character like that? Do you think it might have to do with a plan to do the same thing in the West? And that's something that has never been discussed in regard to this entire refugee problem. That even aside from the fact that there are going to be jihadis among the refugees, and no sane person would say, uh, well, you know, I have this bowl of M&Ms and 10 of them are poisoned, but the rest are okay, so I'll just have a handful. Aside from that, there is the question of the values and the mores that are being brought by the refugees. Now this problem is completely obscured by charges of racism. And that it must be that people who raise this problem in the West are just racists and so they have no right to be heard in polite society and no reason for their, their, their considerations to be given any proper uh, evaluation because it's all just race hatred. But actually, what we're discussing here tonight has nothing to do with race. We're discussing an ideology that is held by people of all races. And it just happens that the people who are holding it are coming from Syria and uh, Iraq and so on. Actually, only up until recently, nobody would have said that people from Syria or Iraq were of any different racial uh, uh, background from the people here but now it's become a, uh, a massive racist problem. The thing is, when you have a ready-made model of society and governance that considers itself superior to that which is held by the majority and the minority with this ready-made model of society and governance thinks themselves to be superior to the people that they are coming to and they have a mandate to replace the model of society and governance that prevails in the place they're coming to with the one that they're bringing, this is an ideological problem. And it has nothing to do with race whatsoever, despite whatever appearances there may be. <clears throat> now, is there such an understanding? Well, the Quran says in chapter 3, verse 110 to the Muslims, you are the best of people on earth. Now, why are the Muslims the best of people on earth? It is not because their race is better than anybody else. And if you were to convert to Islam tomorrow, you would not change races. Your race would be the same. But it says, you are the best of people on the earth because you enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. 
The unspoken corollary there is that the other people on earth who are not Muslims do not enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. In Western societies, there are law codes. There are societal mores and customs. There are assumptions about what is right and what is wrong, and laws about what is right and what is wrong. They do not always match up with Islamic law. Islamic law forbids criticism of Islam on pain of death. In the West, ostensibly, we have the freedom of speech and can criticize whatever belief system we wish to criticize, at least so far or for now. Islam says that you can beat a woman from whom you di fear disobedience. This is in the Quran. That a woman's inheritance should only be half that of a man, a woman's inheritance should be less than that of a man, and her testimony valued in court is only half that of a man. That a man can have four wives, and as, as well as the slave girls, the captives of the right hand, which are essentially sex slaves, as ISIS has shown us. These things are not compatible with the laws, with the ideas of what's right and wrong that prevail in the West. But if you come from a background that tells you, well, you're better than they are, and you enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, then which system of right and wrong are you going to accept? And which one are you going to be willing to adhere to once you, once you emigrate? Because the reward is only incumbent upon Allah to give to you if you emigrate in the way of Allah. That is, if you emigrate to bring Islam to the new land. While the best of people enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, the Quran also says that those who have disbelieved, be they from the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians primarily, so that's probably most of the people here tonight, or even if you're just, you would say, no, 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 I'm an atheist, you're of the background, you're, 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 then you are a Jew or a Christian, or among those who associate others with Allah in his divinity, that would be anybody who believes in gods other than Allah, so that's really basically everybody else. They shall be in the fire and will remain in it. They are the most vile of created beings. So here you are, you're the best of people because you know what's right and you forbid what's wrong. And you're coming to the society of the most vile of created beings. Which law code are you going to respect? Not only that, <clears throat> I got this Quran in London a few years back when I could still go there. And when I went to London, I did what any ordinary tourist from the United States would do. I visited the local mosques. And in the Finsbury Park Mosque, I was greeted by a very kind young man who saw me as a potential convert to Islam, and he gave me a lot of books, a lot of books. And one of them was this very nice Quran. And uh, the Finsbury Park Mosque is interesting. You may have heard of it a few years back because it was the center of jihad plotting in London. And there was an imam there who, in an excess of piety, he had had a bomb-making accident and had blown off both of his hands and injured his eye. So he had these two hooks for hands. Abu Hamza al-Masri was his name. And he had two hooks for hands and, and an eye that was just white with no pupil. And a very fearsome looking character. He is now in prison. <clears throat> He's now in prison in the US for attempting to set up a jihad, an al-Qaeda training camp in Oregon. And anyway, he was at the Finsbury Park Mosque. I walked in there a few years later and I said, I hear you had some trouble here a few years back. And the very kind young man who was giving me all the books said, yes, yes, we, we did. We had some extremists here, but they're all gone, and now we're all moderates. And he gave me this moderate Quran. <clears throat> now, the great thing about this moderate Quran is that it has moderate notes that explain the text to you. The notes are by Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi. Maududi was a Pakistani Muslim politician and, G and Islamic scholar. He uh, died in 1979. He was the founder of jamaat e islami which is still the largest Islamist political party in Pakistan. And he also was a scholar of the Quran and Islam. He wrote a multi-volume commentary on the Quran, and this is a one-volume digest of it. <coughs> and Maududi is very mainstream. I guarantee you that if you go to your local Islamic bookstore, next time you go there, ask them for the writings of Maududi. I guarantee you they'll have them. He is completely mainstream. And he wrote moderate notes to this moderate Quran. 
So it's very, very important to, I, I carry this one around because people often say, as a matter of fact, invariably when I quote this book, people say, well, you're taking that out of context. And I've never managed to quote the Quran in context. And I've given up trying, actually. I just let Maududi give the context. And Maududi actually is very helpful in that regard, especially when it comes to verses like chapter 9, verse 29, which says, fight against those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and do not forbid what he has forbidden of the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book, remember that's the Jews and the Christians, until they pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. <clears throat> Now, I just quoted that out of context, so let's get the context from Maududi. He says, the purpose for which the Muslims are required to fight. Oh, well, that's interesting right there. Muslims are required to fight. Not just exhorted or allowed or permitted, but required to fight. Okay? Is not, as one might think, to compel the unbelievers into embracing Islam. Okay, so that's reassuring. We're not going to be forced to become Muslim. So what are we in for? <clears throat> Rather, its purpose is to put an end to the rule of the unbelievers so that the latter are unable to rule over people. Do you understand the maximalism of that statement? To put an end to the rule of unbelievers so that the latter are unable to rule over people. That is, Anywhere, any government that is not constituted according to Islamic law, he is saying is illegitimate and Muslims are required to fight against it. The authority to rule, he goes on, should only be vested in those who follow the true faith. Unbelievers who do not follow this true faith should live in a state of subordination. <clears throat> the unbelievers are required to pay jizya, the tax, in return for the security provided to them as the dhimmis, protected people of an Islamic state, jizya symbolizes the submission of the unbelievers to the rule of Islam. Now, like I said, you can go in, go into your Ottawa Islamic bookstore and you will find Maududi's writings. There he is saying, Muslims are required to fight until all government is Islamic and the unbelievers are living in a state of subordination. Historically that prevailed throughout the Islamic empires. The great caliphates of the past always made the unbelievers live in a state of subordination. They always had to pay the tax, they had to not build new houses of worship or repair old ones so their communities were always in decline. They had to not hold authority over Muslims so that they were always at the most menial level, the, the taking the most menial jobs in society that wouldn't involve being the boss over a Muslim. If a Muslim was coming down the street, they had to step off and let him pass, like in the Jim Crow South in the U.S. All of this was meant to enforce the state of subordination designed to remind them every day that they were the most vile of created beings for having rejected the true faith of Islam. Now, <clears throat> there are tens of thousands of migrants coming to the West who will never strap on a bomb and blow themselves up in a crowd of infidels, but who do believe that that is the book of Allah, the perfect and eternal book that was delivered perfect in perfect form to Muhammad and is valid for all time. And they do believe that they will be rewarded by Allah for emigrating in the way of Allah. And that it's their responsibility once they are here to replace the government of the most vile of created beings with the government of the best of people who enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. Now what are, what are we supposed to do about that? we're supposed to say it's racist to oppose this and be quiet. That is the only solution that has been offered by the Western political and media elites. <clears throat> As to the problem of societal upheaval that they are visiting upon us in this regard, they have nothing to say except that it will not happen and cannot happen because 
they assume that Islam is a religion of peace that does not teach the things that I just read you out from the Quran and then from Maududi's commentary. Unfortunately, I didn't print that book myself. And that verse about making the people of the book pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued is in every Quran in the world. Maududi's commentary is mainstream and is echoed by thousands of other Islamic scholars. <clears throat> so what we are doing is importing a massive population of people among whom there will be many, not all of them of course, because no group is unanimous in mind, and e among Muslims as much as among everybody else, there are people who will call themselves Muslims, but they're really rather sick of it and they don't really want to have anything to do with it, or they're just not interested in it and they're not devout. But there will be many who are coming here with the goal of imposing their own values and mores and standards, including the devaluation and dehumanization of women, the institutionalized discrimination against non-Muslims, the extinguishing of the freedom of speech. <clears throat> All these things have to be brought into the public discourse. For whatever his faults, and they are many, Donald Trump, whatever they may be, Donald Trump is to be commended at least for advancing the public debate in that regard and making it possible to discuss these things in the public forum to, a, to at least some degree. But the universal excoriation that was heaped upon him is not a good sign, although it was entirely to be expected. For whatever reason, the Western political and media elites are unanimous in thinking that this is all going to be very good for us and nothing is going to go wrong. <clears throat> the thing that they have against them is not an alternative media source. We don't really have that except in small pockets on the internet. And it's not a viable political force against them, although I do think that could coalesce rather quickly because the main thing they have against them is reality. The force of events is going to make it clear that we were not fear-mongering and not being racist, but telling the truth about a real threat. And the more that that threat advances and meets with success, the more the people who would be willing to come to a talk like this tonight will double and triple and quadruple and the more people will take action. <clears throat> the truth cannot be hidden. One of the reasons why we hear all the time that Islam is a religion of peace and that the next jihad terror attack has nothing to do with Islam except insofar as innocent Muslims are victimized in a backlash in the wake of it, we hear that constantly because it's so false, it's so manifestly false, that they have to keep repeating it in order to put it, put it across. Joseph Goebbels said that in Nazi Germany that you have the big lie, you keep repeating the big lie long enough and pe often enough and people will believe it. What we have now is a much more sophisticated variation on that theme and a much more persistent and relentless variation on that theme. With these absolute falsehoods being repeated and repeated and repeated, but every time they're repeated it shows the anxiety of the elites in that they know that their position is eroding and they know that their position is increasingly risible, absolutely ridiculous, because it so manifestly flies in the face of the facts. And so I come to you tonight actually in spite of all the bad news that I've set out, I feel quite confident, more and more all the time, that uh, all this is going to turn and turn quickly. A few years before the Berlin Wall fell, people were, the, the learned analysts, the mainstream commentators were saying, we're going to have to devise strategies to deal with the Soviet Union for 50 years, for 100 years, for the long term. And then in three years it was gone. It's the same thing here. Ultimately, the lies, however, however sophisticated and however complex the edifice that has been constructed on the basis of the lies, its foundation is weak and it's doomed to collapse and the collapse will be sudden. All we have to do is keep standing for the truth and keep insisting insofar as we have any voice anywhere 
And this is my answer to your question. Well, what can we do? Whatever you can do is bound by your own talents, your own time, and your own commitment. But you need to understand nobody else is going to do it for you. And I exhort you to devote all your energies, as much as you possibly can, in your circle, whatever it may be, to trying to wake people up to the reality of what's going on and to do everything they can to put pressure upon our elected officials to turn this around. And it can be done, and it will ultimately be done, but the longer we put it off, the more difficult it's going to be. But I would exhort you finally in conclusion <coughs> not to be worried about it, and things are going to be difficult, and things are going to get worse, but there's no way we can't win, and there's no way we will not prevail because reality just has a way of breaking through. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he was chronicling the resistance to the communist tyranny in the Soviet Union, he said that it was as if we had all been paved over with concrete and we were the blades of grass underneath the concrete and completely stifled and suffocated. But the blades of grass break through the concrete and ultimately reclaim if the concrete is not constantly reinforced the blades of grass will win out and so will we thank you very much